What if interstellar travel is impossible, no matter how advanced we get? For generations, we've been told one story, that humanity's destiny is written in the stars, that one day we'd leave our cradle, earth, and journey to distant suns, becoming a truly galactic species. It's a powerful, intoxicating dream, woven into our science fiction and our deepest aspirations. But what if that story is a fantasy? What if the universe has put up barriers that we simply can't break through? Crushing distances, lethal radiation, and the fundamental laws of physics. This isn't a story about giving up on that dream. This is the story of how humanity, faced with being confined to our cosmic neighborhood, forged an entirely new destiny. It's the story of how we built a sprawling civilization, not across the galaxy, but within the rich and vast expanse of our own solar system. The dream of interstellar travel dies not with a bang, but with a quiet, brutal dose of reality. The nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is over four light years away. With our everyday chemical rockets, that's a trip of tens of thousands of years. Even with more advanced propulsion concepts we've designed, like fusion rockets, we're still talking about a journey that would last for centuries. But the problem runs deeper than just building a faster engine. First, there's the tyranny of energy. The physics are simple. Accelerating a large ship to even a fraction of light speed would require a staggering amount of power, a monumental engineering and economic challenge for any civilization. It creates a vicious cycle. More speed needs more fuel, which adds more mass, which in turn demands exponentially more energy. Then there's the hazard of space itself. Outside the protective bubble of Earth's magnetic field is a constant storm of high-energy cosmic radiation that shreds DNA and fries electronics. While we have ideas for shielding, like using water or creating magnetic fields, the sheer mass required would make that energy problem even harder to solve. A multi-generational journey through that environment would be incredibly dangerous. And finally, there's the strange heartbreak of time. If a crew ever did travel near light speed, time dilation means they might only experience a few decades, but centuries or even millennia would pass back on Earth. They would arrive not as pioneers, but as ghosts from a past that no longer exists, forever cut off from home. Faced with these overwhelming obstacles, the grand ambition begins to shift. It's not that a physical law makes it impossible, but the sheer difficulty leads humanity to a new conclusion. Maybe the stars aren't our destination after all. For a civilization that has always looked up and out, this realization could have sparked an existential crisis. But humanity is resilient. When one frontier proves too difficult, we find another. If we can't go outward, then we'll go inward, turning our gaze back to the worlds we once saw as mere stepping stones. The new plan is this. What if we applied all the ingenuity we dreamed of using for the stars to our own cosmic backyard? This isn't a consolation prize. It's a redefinition of what it means to explore. The solar system isn't just an empty void with a few planets. It's a continent of resources and diverse environments waiting for us. This pivot starts with a revolution in technology and economics. As fully reusable rockets make getting to orbit dramatically cheaper, the industrialization of space shifts from a distant dream to a solid business plan. The focus is no longer on fleeing the solar system, but on mastering it. The moon becomes an industrial powerhouse, its soil rich in metals and perfect for building, its low gravity an ideal launch pad for missions deeper into the system. It stops being a place for just flags and footprints and becomes a factory floor. With the moon as our industrial base, the first great project begins, settling Mars. The idea of terraforming the red planet into a second Earth is quickly shelved. Studies suggest there just isn't enough accessible carbon dioxide to create a thick, breathable atmosphere with near-term technology. So, instead, humanity goes underground. Vast subterranean cities, shielded from surface radiation by meters of rock, become the new frontier. 
Carved into canyons and buried beneath the rusty plains, these habitats evolve into unique societies. Colonists use ice mined from the ground for water and extract minerals from the Martian soil. Life on Mars becomes a strange paradox. People are confined to immense, artificially lit caverns, but they're driven by a powerful sense of exploration on the surface, using robotic avatars and shielded vehicles to survey the silent landscapes. A new identity is born, the Martian, fiercely proud of thriving in a world that was never meant for them. At the same time, we turn to a world that seems even less likely, Venus. The surface is a hellscape, so landing there is off the table. But its thick, dense atmosphere offers a bizarre opportunity, floating cities. At just the right altitude, the pressure and temperature are surprisingly Earth-like. Aerostat habitats, like giant scientific balloons, become outposts and then thriving communities. Suspended in the pale yellow clouds, these Venusian cities are a testament to humanity's knack for finding a home in the most extreme places. We're charting a course through centuries of this new human history. If you're enjoying this journey and want to explore more speculative futures, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. It really helps us build these worlds. Now let's push further out. The true economic engine of this new civilization lies in the asteroid belt. This vast, scattered region of space becomes a treasure trove. Robotic mining fleets sent from the Moon and Mars harvest staggering quantities of metals and other rare elements. Having all these raw materials available in zero gravity completely changes the game. Manufacturing moves off-planet. Instead of launching heavy, finished goods out of Earth's deep gravity well, we build them right there in orbit, using resources from the asteroids. This leads to the most ambitious engineering project in human history, the O'Neill Cylinder. These aren't cramped space stations, they're artificial worlds. Kilometers long cylinders spin to create artificial gravity, and inside, entire landscapes are built, forests, rivers, and towns, all bathed in sunlight, directed by giant mirrors. The first cylinders are homes for the miners and their families, but they quickly become something more. City-states in their own right, attracting millions. Life in a cylinder offers a new kind of freedom, freedom from a planet itself. The Belters, as they're known, develop a unique culture where down is just a direction you choose and the sky is a ceiling you can touch. This boom also kickstarts the development of space-based solar power with massive orbital arrays beaming clean, limitless energy back to Earth and the other colonies. The final frontier of this solar-bound civilization is the domain of the gas giants. Jupiter, with its intense radiation, remains mostly the realm of robots, but its moons are tantalizing. Europa, with its hidden subsurface ocean, becomes a holy grail for science. Shielded research outposts on the ice deploy submersibles into the dark waters below, searching for the first proof of extraterrestrial life. The real prize of the outer system, though, is Saturn's moon, Titan. With its thick nitrogen atmosphere and rivers of liquid methane, it's the most Earth-like and yet utterly alien world we know. Colonists on Titan live in domed cities, using the moon's abundant hydrocarbons for energy. Titanians become experts in cryoengineering, even developing synthetic life forms that can survive in the frigid, alien environment. The ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, become vital refueling depots. Their atmospheres are rich in the water and other materials needed to sustain this sprawling civilization. A network of trade routes now spans the entire solar system, connecting the energy-rich inner worlds to the resource-rich outer reaches. Centuries into this future, humanity is no longer a single species living on one planet. It's a mosaic of connected but distinct societies. An Earther might live their entire life under an open blue sky, while a Martian knows only the vaulted ceilings of their cavern cities, and a Belter is raised in the gentle, constant gravity of a spinning world. This diversification brings new challenges. Tensions emerge over resources, trade routes, and political power. 
A solar authority might be formed to manage these interplanetary relations, but conflicts between the inner worlds and the independent-minded outer colonies are inevitable. The psychological toll of living in artificial environments also becomes a serious concern, requiring new forms of mental health care and community support. And yet, for all their differences, these new branches of humanity are united by their shared origin and their shared confinement. They know they're in this together, a single spark of life in a vast, silent cosmos. This knowledge completely reframes the Fermi paradox. Perhaps the Great Silence isn't because other civilizations don't exist, but because they too are trapped in their own home systems by the same unforgiving laws of physics. It's one possible explanation among many, but a powerful one. We started this story with what felt like a broken dream, the dream of reaching the stars. But what grew in its place wasn't a lesser destiny. In being denied the galaxy, humanity was forced to truly get to know itself and its home. We learned that an entire universe can be found in a single solar system, which is vast enough to contain infinite dreams. We never left, but we also never stopped exploring. We built worlds, forged new societies, and turned our cosmic backyard into a home. The human spirit, unbroken, found its purpose not in how far it could travel, but in the depth and richness of what it could build right here. Perhaps the true measure of a civilization isn't how many stars it can reach, but how well it learns to cultivate its own garden.